Making a life worth living in retirement worth having is really about who we allow in our lives. You see, there are people in this world who try to harm others. They think that if they tell enough lies to themselves about what they can and cannot do underneath federal law and international human rights law, that maybe they will get away with harming someone who has other rights that are not theirs. You see, in practical usefulness of our world, men and women do lie. Let's talk about the reasons why which people lie. Now, there's two types of lies, in my opinion. There is the lie that is blatant, obvious, that is, I am lying to get something that I long to have. And that is a lie. There is another type of lie that is a self-protection lie. It's sort of one of those things like a child sometimes that is trying to shrug responsibility, but other times in this situation, it is an adult who says, my life, my body, my personhood, my paperwork, my property deserves the rights it has. And as a result, I'm going to choose this small lie to protect my personhood from harm. Now, that is self-defense. Openly, it is self-protection techniques. When we teach women self-defense and men approach them outside, we tell them what to say. It may be a blatant lie of where they're headed or what they're doing, but it is a self-protection opportunity to preserve one's self in this world where men and sometimes ugly women harm a life. Now, practically, it is still a violation of the law to do something like that in a way that makes no sense to other people. You see, there is other aspects of lying that some people don't get. There's something called a non-disclosure agreement. Now, in professional realms, a non-disclosure agreement means I'm not going to talk about what I sell you or what I do for you in a public or private setting. I'm going to protect your right to privacy, your right to intellectual property. I'm going to protect your right to confidentiality. And I'm literally going to make sure that my secret that we have between what we're doing in this world, whether it be professional or personal or intimate, remains just that, private to the two of us. Openly, there might be a verbal agreement, or there might be actually a legal agreement, a legal document in place that allows that person the privacy of their body, their mind, their heart, their soul, their intelligence, their intellectual wherewithal, or any other aspect of their service in the professional realm. Now, why am I talking about this? Because we have lots of laws that are coming into play right now that are violating our own rights to our own privacy. We literally have people in positions of power who literally take away our rights. They think, I'll just keep doing things. I'll just keep playing games. I'll just keep stealing things. I'll just keep putting things back. I'll just keep mobbing this person by every time they stop somewhere to get food, I'll get into a vehicle that's not my lawful right to do so. I'll get into their bags. I'll take things. I'll move things about. I'll monkey around in what they're trying to do to produce a life for themselves or money for themselves. And I'll make sure that this individual never gets ahead in life. Now, that in itself is a vile act. That is actually stalking. It is hazing. It is harassment. It is federally illegal. It is certainly immoral. And underneath human rights law, it is unwelcome to most people. You see, in this world, we have lots of rights. We have rights to live our lives in a way in which we feel is in accordance to our faith in the Lord above. And when I say that, I mean our faith is for our life. Our faith does not project itself into someone else's life unless they allow us permission. Now, underneath the Declaration of International Human Rights, that is a world standard of the NATO organization, and for those of you who don't know what that is, look it up if you're too young or too old to remember. It's basically the world governance on how we respect and regard human life. Human life produces other human life. Some humans don't have the ability to have children. Other humans make the choice literally not to have some. They realize in their own selfishness or their own plans for their life that they just want a life partner and they want to live out their days without the responsibility, the liabilities, the financial debts that a child requires. Many men also just like to procreate, so they produce heirs. Some men take total control and responsibility for the men and children 
and excuse me, women that are produced from their liaisons, whether they're short term, one night stands, or long term. But openly, there are other people who are more responsible who literally just talk about it on the radio, in fact, or they abstain. They choose not to interact in those intimate relations, or they produce some way to protect themselves from creating offspring to create the liabilities and the financial expenditures that a child brings into this practical world. Every mouth has to be fed, every person has to be roofed and housed, and every individual has to have clothes on their being. Those produce natural expenditures. Now, when I'm talking about things, I'm talking about real life. I'm not talking about some funny little idea here. I'm talking about the real life of producing a loving family. You see, we are all born into families, but not everyone likes their own family. Many people find themselves at odds in their relationships in their families for a lot of reasons. The most fundamental reasons are the, the, the over-objectifying of a person's life. In some families, they terrorize an individual. There has been many television shows on television and in movies about how people are abused. People are emotionally abused, people are financially abused, people are physically abused, and people are litigationally abused, which is a sort of relatively new term where someone in that person's relationship group decides to just keep throwing the law and police at them all day long so that there's a litany and series of litigational notes, incident reports by police who have violated the law in participating in mobbing a person's life, which is a violation of civil rights law for anyone who is paying attention to what happened during that era. But in reality, mobbing is an immoral act. Now, how do we know this? Because we learned about this in the Bible long ago. So those men and women who profess to be people of faith and are in authority places, they must be really careful about what they do in the name of the Lord. You see, they are not the Lord. They cannot possibly interpret the Lord's plan for people's lives, and they most certainly cannot say what the Lord did and did not create in this world. Isn't that the truth? Or am I just speaking rhetoric like someone who's a left fielder or right fielder, and I don't even know which field it's in. But the reality is that politicians utilize faith all day long to project their beliefs on other people's rights. Human rights law is something that the American population has sort of forgotten about. We flock to emergencies and disasters. We literally drop everything. We take time off work if unless we're retired. And we literally will pick up and go help in a tornado aftermath or a hurricane problem. Or like what happens in New Orleans long ago when they were so pummeled by hurricanes. Now maybe that was God's way of saying this place needs a cleanup majorly. We need to disperse these people like I did with the Tower of Babel and we need to produce a better level and quality of understanding of human life. That is really the issue here today. Do we have a quality of life is not the problem in America most of the time. Whether or not we really are producing a love of human life is something else entirely. You see, we have this idea of human rights only being in third world countries. Eleanor Roosevelt was appalled, I guess, about what she saw when she traveled with her husband as president in other lands. So she helped to produce this doctrine, or at least she's getting credit for it. But really, it was a lot of nations that produced that, that documentation. So many, many world powers feel that international declaration of human rights is a fundamental right of a human being to be treated as equal in all aspects of the law and governing of him or herself, particularly in the area of police enforcement, harassment by those authority figures, improper detention, and most importantly, a their own literal right to choose a physician and whether or not they will allow something to be put on them or in their being. Now, there is a movement <coughs> called the Blue Line where police feel that they are that Gotham-oriented, Batman-oriented thin line before good between good and evil in the land, and that is not their role. Their role is to follow simply the procedures of policing and doing good work in terms of investigation and writing quality reports. Their role is also to make sure that no lie is told in a report that could harm a person's name. Now, why would they want to do this? Well, because one bad 
police officer taints them all, much like the apple barrel. That if you've got a bad apple with a worm in it, most likely you're going to get more worms in the rest of the apples. But also because the public has to trust the people they call for help when it's time to call for help. And if one person in that force ruins the life of someone indiscriminately or based on some philosophical or religious-oriented ideal that they are holding personally that is not a part of the law, then openly that person will never again trust another police officer with any possible hazing, harassment, or difficulties going on in their life. We've certainly seen plenty of film that produces things like that and stories like that. We've seen women who've been abused and battered by husbands not being taken seriously. So they go out, they learn martial arts, and they literally have to fight for their lives because nobody listened to them about the hazing and harassment they were still experiencing or the stalking that was going on. We have seen a lot of popular stars participate in things like Monster and other stories. And in truth, even J-Lo portrayed a woman who was stalked by a man who was a monster. He looked good on paper, he looked good to the rest of the world, but he was a monster in his soul. Now the monsters in the world are not only the people that we don't see. Openly, there are monsters within our own family who believe that if they produce enough lies, they can harm a life to take over that control of that person's life and literally ruin them with all sorts of litigational things. There are physicians who will participate based on their religious grounds. There are people from other countries that have different beliefs about how the body it works and how cellular health functions, but they are not the Lord, and they may or may not even have a faith in a Christian-oriented world of the Lord. They may not read the Quran, they may not read the Bible, they may not read any religious work in their life, but they've got an idea, an ethical thought, that they're not going to allow someone to produce a life for themselves. Yet we have the extremes in the different coasts where people literally flock because they're more open there to live out their days, to love, love the way they choose, and to openly have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness without harm from their families. In many situations, people don't realize how ill-willed they can be towards others. How many times has someone reached out to you and said, I'm looking for a job, and you react by simply saying, gosh, I don't know anyone hiring someone. That is a lie you tell yourself. That is a lie you openly tell yourself because you might in fact actually be a recruiter or in reality you actually have a huge network of people in theory through your Facebook channel, through your networking channels, through your local networking groups, through your LinkedIn accounts, and through your organizations of which you participate with tons of people. You cannot make that decision for those people that they have no position for someone you literally know. The reality is it is not your job to establish or determine whether or not that person is right for any position or any other aspect of opportunity that your liaisons, your acquaintances, your colleagues, your professional network might have for an individual. All you have to do is be willing to care just enough about that individual looking for a job and understand just enough compassionately about how difficult it can be to produce a new job after a little certain age in life that you are willing to say, hey, I've got this pal. I don't know him all that well professionally, but he's looking for a job. Would anybody be open to talking to him and giving him a possibility of employment or her for that matter? You see, in life, we have moments in time to help people, and then we have moments in time where people, siblings, families, relatives, neighbors, just say, we're just going to ruin this man's life because we feel like participating in the mob on his life. I have produced many works in this moment of time to produce myself an audio program. I'm looking to become a podcaster and a radio show host. I literally got that degree when I was in high school. I got that certification in high school. That card has been stolen from my life since then. I used to have it, but it's no longer with me. A lot of my things have been pilfered. And I have to ask myself, what is it that gives people the belief that they can devalue the human life and the human story so much that they think they have the lawful right under their version of some holy figure to steal and mob a person to death? Openly, that's what they do. They lie, they steal, they cheat, and they say, my lie is not equal to or greater than another person's lie. But no, what the reality is that when someone chooses not to disclose something about their physical health, that is their lawful right underneath federal law. 
when the nation decides that they're going to start to govern people's health, like we're starting to see happening, where these major conglomerate hospitals in our Indianapolis community are literally sharing our private information with the government, that is a real breach of privacy. We also have the problem that police officers and sheriff and other people in law enforcement do not have to follow HIPAA rules at all. That practically means that if you have gently told your physician who asked you who is your lover right now, that a police officer you don't even know could find that information out. How would you feel about that? Especially if you're having a liaison that may not be exactly on the up and up. But that's not the point. Do you really want that police officer going to your pastor and telling him about what you're about? I don't think so. But I'm talking about real truth. I'm not talking about anything that's happening to me right now. I'm talking about the reality of the law. That under the law, we have the right to have freedom of movement without hazing and harassment and stalking. Under the law, we have the right to our property without things being stolen, thieved from us, or monkeyed around with to the point that they are ruined. Most of my history of my adult life has been physically ruined by people. Business cards I was keeping from different aspects of my life to show the history of what I've done professionally so that I might get employment have been dog-eared, made filthy, written upon. Other parts of my childhood, a beautiful little leather wallet that I kept all my life, was ruined in impound. They literally got it soaking wet, destroying those beautiful old brass snaps, totally making it go green, if you will, when it happens, when the brass gets old. It was in pristine condition before I got my car put into impound. That actual wallet is now missing from my property after literally going to a lunch forced upon me by my sister that I didn't really want to go to. I said no, but she still drove in anyways and expected me to get out of the car and eat with her. Now she paid for it and that's perfectly fine, but that was not my desire to handle my day in that moment of time like that or to even eat that kind of food for myself. But I am sort of stuck in that moment because someone has literally destroyed my vehicle. When it was impound last, they took a muffler off of it and put on an old one. It then cost me most of my money in terms of gas guzzling. But who gave those people the right to do that? Also, my car was once again, after impound found, totally trashed. All my property thrown all over the place. When I went back the second time to look things over, more property reappeared. Thank God for that. Or maybe I just couldn't see it in the pitch blackness of the night and the barely inability to open a door to get into my vehicle, which I think is a real travesty. We are entrusting them with our personal and professional property. My car is owned by my company and I'm going to lose it now because someone who was representing me didn't really give a shit about my life to say this man doesn't have the money to pay for this like you're doing to him. She turned it into a civil matter. It was not a civil matter. In truth, the police had no lawful right to tow my car. They did it out of a desire to protect things, but they didn't really protect things because so much of my property was destroyed, damaged, stolen from. I still can't even find a fork and spoon that I had used to eat out of the cans as I was traveling. Now, who the hell gives these people in those impounds or the police officers the little right to keep getting in and out of our vehicles, in and out of our homes, without so much of as a request to do so. And openly, if it's siblings doing this, how do they really think they're going to get away with that lie in front of God? That somehow they're more holy? I don't think so. Thou shall not steal, thou shall not murder a life, thou shall not operate these ways, is really quite clear in the Bible. In my life, I produced a living in a myriad of 20 hours a week while my siblings worked 40 to 50 or 60 hours a week. They produced a life and I produced a life. I simply chose to work a little smarter. I chose to have family time. I chose to produce gifts and care for the students in my program. And I gave them quality education such that many of them who were the most dedicated, the most diligent, went on to producing language skills in college. Some chose to continue on in Japanese. Others chose German. Some learned multiple languages. Why? And they told me. One young man told me. Once he learned how to study from my program, starting with me in junior high, he was able to produce for himself other languages. Actually, multiple. Chinese came next for him, then German and others. And openly, he's quite multilingual and he's lived abroad now. I'm pretty proud of him for taking advantage of all he could. 
Now, when I talk like this, I'm talking about real life. But I'm saying, look, the Lord in heaven is looking at every single person who infiltrates a person's home, who literally thinks they have the right to steal their bequeathed property. I had a coin set that I put up on my uh, counter in a room in which I'm presently staying for the moment. I'm not able to stay here long. It's not right for me to stay here long is absolute truth. I've been given a little bit of a gift because it is super cold out, and I have a cold because someone did not protect herself from that cold weather. And she coughed all over me and coughed all over food, and that produced an illness that I've got to deal with. So I'm staying a little bit longer, but I won't stay forever. The reality is that my coins from my father, bequeathed to me by my dad, a long time ago that I've literally carried in my pocket, on my person, for more than a year since I've gone through this, has been pilfered from my bags, openly also from that counter. Who gave that person the right to do that? Now, if it's possible that I accidentally thought it was a set of pills and I was throwing it away, and I threw it in the trash, I went out and I looked in the trash. It was nowhere to be found in the trash. I will look again, but in truth, it's not someone's lawful right to get into a person's trash that hasn't even been set at the curb. Now, practically, I've had a lot of letters stolen from me at my mailbox that I pay for at the post office. I've had a lot of things stolen from me out of a storage locker that I'm being have paying for by my mother, who has been somewhat kind in her help of my struggle through homelessness and loss of employment and loss of opportunity because I have no real technology that does a lot for me right now. You see, so many people think that homelessness is about the derelicts or the people who have some sort of addiction. That's not true. When a police group, when a mobbing group, when a family group decides to harm a life, they just do it. They don't think about the law. They don't think about whether it's right or wrong in front of God. And they certainly don't think about the consequences to their own lives, their own futures, and their own eventual passage into heaven about what they've done. You see, so many people don't take a moment to pray and go, Lord, am I really supposed to be on this path, harming this life? So many people just fumble through their jobs without a thought to what they look like from God's perspective. I've seen that happen many times in a lot of places now. That people just mouth off at the cuff without literally thinking about how it looks to God when they do it. People need to pause a little bit more. They need to pray a little bit more. <clears throat> they need to ponder a little bit more. They need to speak a lot less. They need to listen a lot more. And openly, they need to look at their life when it comes time for them to go home to heaven. Are they going to be the most honorable person they could have possibly been when they go? Or have they made enough sins against other people that they really are going to have to reap what they sow in heaven? I already know that several of my siblings have lost a lot of crowns in heaven. They did so because they thought they were more powerful than God. They also thought that the law didn't matter in their life. And that puts them at legal risk. Any person who's lawful could report them for their violations of federal law, of getting into vehicles, of lying about what their rights are, and of taking important documentation from an adult man's life. That's the truth. Now, openly, I'm talking about real things. I'm sharing part of my life. But I'm talking about your life in truth. I'm saying, who in your life is protecting your life from harm? Who in your life is protecting your property from being stolen? Who in your life is showing regard for your human life, which is really what this all boils down to? You see, when people start to take human life for granted, <clears throat> practically because we have films that show murder, we have war games and television games that do all this sort of stuff all the time, we lose our rights in other people's lives. We literally think that if I just murder this part of their life a little bit, they can't produce anything. If I just take this part for them, then I am superior and I'm powerful in that person's life. No, you're not. The Lord in heaven is watching you ruin a life. And you'll be held accountable for all of that if you have any practical faith at all in the spirit land or in what happens after a person passes. Sure, there are atheists out there who say, we don't go anywhere, we just go into the mud. I know a guy like that. He's a brilliant intellectual professor in a university and working in some sort of service group. I hope he's produced a new view of God, but I can pretty much prove there is a spirit world. I can show it energetically, and I can just say, you know what? The people who don't get this are missing out on the magic of God. 
But the mayhem that men create because of their lies to themselves about their power in other people's lives is a scary business, in my opinion, because hell is not a place that we have heard about is not true, that openly we see it in these horrible movies, but in truth, some of that might actually be actual. How often are you really willing to stand before the Lord and say, I stole these items of religious background from this man because I didn't feel it was right for him? You see, the Lord puts a passion in a person's life for the love of God. And whatever that religious object is, whatever that book is, whatever that little thing job he utilizes is, came practically from God in him or in her, saying, this is right for you right now in your life. So when people make fun of metaphysical folks or steal oracle cards or steal crosses or ruin them like I had happened in Impound, they show God that they have no care for the human life in front of them. When we are looking for how to help people, we must really sincerely say, am I the right person to help them? And if I'm not, I need to stay the hell away from them. Because my life before the Lord, in front of my long wait to go towards heaven, where I'm supposed to have the presence of all that I have reaped and all that I have produced for my life, is coming. And we never know exactly when that's going to happen. People miss out on the loves of their lives because they don't listen to God saying, Go now, help him now, help her now, make love now, stop worrying about everything now, and openly they just ruin lives. You see, mobbing does happen in this world. People get a ping on their phone like those programs that show us the dance mobs. It's no different for mobbing. They get some photo on their phone, they get some little piece of information that may be a truth or may be a lie, and they participate in illegal activities on another man's or another woman's life. They provide information about people, what they buy at the store. They walk around and peek in someone's cart. They ruin their lives. By doing that, they participate in a lie, thinking they have a right to to voyeur in on someone's life and make decisions for them about what they may and may not have in their own property, their own baggage, their own bank accounts, their own storage lockers, their own anything. And that is a lie they tell themselves. That is a satanic force lying to them about how the Lord looks at them. God will always look at the thief as a liar. He will always practically protect and help those who do not lie. And therein lies the difference that in order to produce a life worth living and a retirement worth having, we must stop believing the lies being told in our souls about our rights in other people's lives. The Lord in heaven is watching you right now. Whether or not you believe it or not, that's up to you. But practically, I can almost prove it to myself based on the number of times my little bot has been saved by li simply listening to what I feel is my practical level of faith and understanding who the liars are and who the people are that are worth spending time with. In life, we have moments of time to help people. Feeding a person is a simple kindness that God would expect of anyone. But harming a person, intentionally stealing from them, ruining their property, that is a monstrous act of the satanic force. And if you're participating in it, you really want to think more about what's going to happen to you when you go on to heaven. You might just not get there. You see, no person who steals like that and maliciously harms a life will go easily into the night. And that is the truth promised in the biblical works of all ages. In life, I have talked about many things. I talk about the Lord a little bit, but people get tired of that sometimes because they don't want to believe in the faith or because they don't have a strong enough faith or maybe because they feel it's a violation of their privacy for someone to talk about God to them. But I'm not an evangelist. I'm not going to stand on any street corner like a Jehovah's Witness pretending to be loving. I literally had a conversation with a Jehovah's Witness boy the other day, and I call him a boy because he could barely handle the conversation. When I simply told him he wasn't mature enough for that role, he didn't say a word. When the older man who was supposed to be there to sponsor him came around, he didn't talk to me at all. And I'm a homeless person who literally could have been saved in some moment of time by the moment of kindness that any one of those two men could have produced. They failed to do it. I don't think they really represented Kingdom Hall all that well. And frankly, I told him, if you want to meet people, go in and sit down and eat a meal with people. That's how you know who people are. You also have to realize that while you're doing that, someone might be pilfering things from your vehicle because they have no regard for human life whatsoever. Isn't that a shame that the world we live in now in America believes that we have to tell people to lock their stuff up when in truth our locks don't work and people think they have the right to steal, as opposed to reminding them of what Lord God's law is about 
the Lord of Theft, and also about what federal law and every other human rights law says. You have no right to take another person's property, period. So let's get to the real human rights of today. Human rights means my rights are mine, your rights are yours. They should not intersect at all. Thanks for listening. This has been Blake Henson of Blaze Communications, LLC, saying make it a super day, people.